Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, I'm Bill. Today's video is going to be a continuation of the characters built to level 5, except I'm all out of characters that, or classes that Pathfinder has. So instead of that, let's dive into the one book they have for their epic style campaigns, where 3rd edition actually had an epic handbook, they produced a mythic adventures book. So we'll dive into those classes over the course of the next few videos. And the first thing we're going to go up into is a mythic class um, and the base mythic abilities that all of them get to pick. And then the following video will be the Archmage, the Champion, the Guardian, the Hero Font, the Marshal, the Trickster, and the universal path. So let me flip through to where I need to be. So there are a few ways you can get a mythic character in a campaign, all of which have to be approved by the game master. So you are limited to not being able to create a mythic character just to create a mythic character. A mythic class level is as strong as half of a class level as far as how much more uh, challenge ratings you can go through or how much more challenging the party can be ECL wise. So there are 10 tiers which would be the mythic levels to a mythic class or character. So if you had all 10 mythic uh, tiers in your 20th level, you'd be about as strong as a 25th level character. That said, if you're familiar with the deities and demigods from 3rd edition, based on all the abilities you get here, you would pretty much be a like divine rank zero deity. So, so let's look at the base mythic ability table. At your first uh, tier, you get a mythic feat. You become hard to kill. You gain mythic power and surge plus 1d6. So let's look into that. So mythic feat. There's a list of feats in the book that usually you have to have a prerequisite of the non-mythic version. And those will give you a bigger bonus than you could have had otherwise. Hard to kill. Whenever you're below zero hit points, you automatically stabilize without needing to attempt a constitution check. If you have an ability that allows you to act while below zero hit points, you still lose hit points for taking actions as specified by that ability. Bleed damage still causes you to lose hit points when below zero hit points. In addition, you don't die until your total number of negative hit points is equal to or greater than double your constitution score. Now that becomes very useful in a lot of combats, especially the combats that I run. So at first level, you also get mythic power. Mythic characters can draw upon a wellspring of power to accomplish amazing deeds and abilities. Each day you can expend the amount of mythic power equal to three plus double your mythic tier or mythic level. So at first level it's like five per day, seven per day at second, so on and so forth. This amount is your maximum amount of mythic power. If an ability allows you to regain use of your mythic power, you can never have more than this amount. And then surge. <coughs> Excuse me. Surge, you can call upon your mythic power to overcome difficult challenges. You can expend one use of mythic power to increase any d20 roll you just made by rolling 1d6 and adding it to the results. Using this ability is an immediate action taken after the results of the original roll is revealed. This can change the outcome of the roll. The bonus die gained by using this ability increases as you gain levels. OK, 
Okay, so that's how the search works, which sort of works like the lucky domain or gaining advantage in fifth edition. So mythic tier second level, you get your first ability score bonus and you get amazing initiative. So ability score. Upon reaching the second mythic tier, an ability score of your choice permanently increases by two. At fourth, sixth, eighth, and tenth levels or tiers, another ability score of your choice permanently increases by two. This can be any ability score you've already increased or a different ability score. So that could be really good to really increase the effectiveness of your character based on their abilities. At third level, you get Recuperation and your second Mythic Feat. Oh, I didn't go over Amazing Initiative. Here's Amazing Initiative. At second level, you gain this bonus on initiative checks equal to your Mythic tier. So your Mythic level is added to your initiative checks. That can be very useful in going first especially against certain mythic monsters that have a really good initiative. In addition, as a free action on your turn, you can expend one use of mythic power to take an additional standard action during that turn. This additional standard action can't be used to cast a spell. You can't gain an extra action in this way more than once per round. Now, I might house rule that differently. I might allow a spellcaster an extra action to cast a spell because they're still limited on how many spells they can cast in a day. Besides, if they blow all their spells in one or two combats and there's four or five in the course of the adventure, they're going to have a lot of issues trying to complete the adventure. So now, let's. the third level was Recuperation. At third tier, you are restored to full hit points after eight hours of rest so long as you aren't dead. Now, as far as Mythic games go, I like that. But as far as 5th edition went, as far as their healing, I did not enjoy that. In addition, by expending one use of Mythic power and resting for one hour, you regain a number of hit points equal to half your full hit points. And regain the use of any class features that are limited to a certain number of uses per day, such as the Barbarian Rage, Bardic Performance, Spells Per Day, and so on. This rest is treated as eight hours for sleep for such abilities. This rest doesn't refresh, in, refresh uses of mythic power or any mythic abilities. They are limited to a number of times per day. So all your non-mythic abilities get to be refreshed. And you're burning one of your surges to do it, so that has a lot of balance to it. I like that. So at fourth level or fourth tier, you get your second ability score increase, and then your base mythic ability, your surge, is now 1d8. At level five, you get your third mythic feat, and you get mythic saving throws. Mythic saving throws. At fifth tier, whenever you succeed at a saving throw against a spell or special ability, you suffer no effects as long as that ability didn't come from a mythic score. So it's a, a mythic source, such as a creature with a mythic tier or mythic ranks. If you fail a saving throw that results from a mythic source, you take the full effects as normal. Okay, at sixth level, you get your third ability increase and force of will. At 6th level, you can exert your will to force events to unfold as you would like. As an immediate action, you can expend one use of your mythic power to re-roll a d20 roll you just made. Or force any non-mythic creature to re-roll a d20 roll it just made. You can use this ability after the results are revealed. Whoever re-rolls a roll must take the result of the second roll, even if it's lower. Okay, at 7th level, you get your 4th Mythic Feet, and your Surge becomes 1d10. At 8th level, you get your 4th Ability Increase, 
and you get the unstoppable mythic ability. At eighth tier, you can expend one use of mythic power as a free action to immediately end any one of the following conditions currently affecting you. Bleed, blind, confused, cowering, dazed, dazzled, def deafened, entangled, exhausted, fascinated, fatigued, frightened, nauseated, panicked, paralyzed, shaken, sickened, staggered, or stunned. All other conditions and effects remain, even those resulting from the same spell or effect that caused the selected condition. You can use this ability at the start of your turn, even if a condition would prevent you from acting. Paralysis and such. Okay. At ninth level, you get your fifth mythic feat, which is your final mythic feat as far as your base mythic class abilities that come without having your class itself influence your mythic uh, tiers and whatnot. So, at ninth level, you get immortal, which is here's why you're essentially a divine rank zero deity by the end of this class. Immortal at ninth tier, if you are killed, you return to life 24 hours later. Regardless of the condition of your body or the means by which you were killed, when you return to life, you aren't treated as if you had rested and don't regain the use of abilities that recharge with rest until your next rest. This ability doesn't apply if you're killed by a coup de grace or a critical hit performed by either a mythic creature or a creature of even greater power or a non-mythic creature wielding a weapon capable of bypassing epic damage reduction. A tenth tier, at tenth tier, you can be killed only by a coup de grace or critical hit made with an artifact. Hence again, why you would be treated more like a divine rank zero deity. Legendary hero at level 10. So level 10, you get your last ability increase and you get the legendary hero and your surge becomes 1d12. So legendary hero. At 10th tier, you have reached the height of mortal power. You regain uses of your mythic power at the rate of one use per hour, in addition to completely refreshing your uses each day. Okay, so that's the base of all the mythic classes. So this is what you get no matter what your class tells you you're getting. So that is very interesting and entertaining. The way you become a mythic character can vary. There's three that are proposed in the Mythic uh, Adventures book. One is you're given an artifact that gives you mythic ranks, which temporarily gives you a mythic class of whatever tier the ranks equal. So that's good for like one-shot adventures and such. Then you could get mythic ranks by hunting mythic creatures and slaying them. You have a harder time because they actually have the mythic ranks, so they have mythic abilities that you would have to fight that wouldn't be normal. But that said, that would just make it more interesting. Uh, and over so many creatures hunted and whatnot, you would slowly gain the mythic uh, ranks you need to gain the tiers and whatnot. And they give a progression for that. The other way is your DM decides that now you're going to enter Mythic Games and become a Mythic character. And then he would start you at first level and then level you whenever he sees appropriate. So, and that's probably the means I'm going to take with my party, considering how overpowered they are. And it's mostly because they're just overfunded. But when I start giving them this stuff, they'll have a lot of interesting things that they can add to their characters and new things they can do. Well, this is the base mythic abilities for a mythic character. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below. If you've created a mythic character or seen a mythic character in a game, let me know. Until we meet again.